You know, ever since uh, I was a little kid, I've always wanted to be an athlete. <laughs> but the problem was I was never really good at any sport in particular. When I tell you I was the last one picked for the team, I'm not kidding, actually. But I did go out for football when I was in high school. I was a pretty fast runner. And so I went through all the training, and I even shaved my head, which was hard, because I had really cool surfer blonde hair. I had like a nice little wave that I would do this all the time, you know. And to sacrifice that hair to be in the team, I thought, well, it's worth it. I'm going to be in the team. And I shaved my head. And like literally the day after, I'm called into the principal's office. And they said, you can't be on the football team. I said, why not? They said, your grades are too low. My response was, okay, could you have told me that before I shaved my head? But, you know, one thing I was pretty good at was running. I could outrun most people. Uh, not long distance running, though. Sprinting was what I was better at. Whenever there would be a race, I would be ahead of everyone, but of course I would quickly lose steam and then people would catch up with me and sometimes they would lap me and periodically turtles would pass me. But I was good with that initial burst of steam. Uh, but you know, the Christian life is really a long distance run. And it's something we engage in each and every day. And you know, there's a lot of people want to get out and run, but a lot of people don't follow through. Even when after they buy running shoes, which are very expensive now, by the way, in case you haven't noticed, I read that 87% of those who buy running shoes never use them. 87%. Hey, check out these running shoes. Have you gone for a run? No, but I walked from my car to Starbucks. And I'm looking good, right? So, you know, that's how it is in real life. Now, I am not naturally the kind of guy that wants to go have a workout. Uh, that's the thing I want to get out of doing. It, uh, it's so bad, I don't even like to jog my memory. It's, you know. <laughs> but the last week, I, I, I was at the gym, and I was stretching, and I was bending, and I was lifting. And I was just getting out of the car. That's what's so sad about that. But no, seriously, though, I, I go to the gym uh, seven days a week. I do, yeah. It's on the way to Krispy Kreme Donuts. Just, I go by the gym, I should say. All right, well, anyway. But, you know, if you want to be a real athlete, you have to be committed. You have to work at it. I read that the average Olympic athlete works out four hours a day, 310 days a year, for six years to compete for the goal. And then once, if you are selected to be on the Olympic team, which is a great honor, of course... Uh, you know, you have to discipline yourself and a very important thing, you must play by the rules. You know, it's a funny thing. We have sort of a trend, I think, in children's sports, especially today, where they say, you know, we don't really keep tabs on who's winning because everyone's a winner. By the way, that is, I don't think that's a good thing to do for kids because that's not the way it is in the real world, okay? We give kids you know, trophies for showing up. It's a participation trophy. Okay, newsflash. In the race of life, God wants us to win. <laughs> he doesn't want us to just show up. It's not just about running. It's about winning. And you know when they say everyone's a winner? That's actually not true. Everyone is not a winner. There are losers in the race of life because they bail or they break the rules Oh, they don't finish what they've started. God wants us to win in this race. 1 Corinthians 9.24, it says, Remember in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize. So run in such a way that you will win. Every athlete practices self-control. They do it to win a prize that will fade away. But we're doing it for an eternal prize. So I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should, Otherwise, after I have preached to others, I myself would be disqualified. And we could illustrate this with a lot of examples of athletes who maybe won an Olympic event, but it was found out later that, that they'd been um, using steroids or in some other way they broke the rules and so they even had their gold medal taken from them on some occasions. Well, anyway... We want to run this race of life, and we want to run it well. So there are things that sort of slow us down in the race of life. Things that impede our progress. What are they? Let's go back now to Philippians 2 and look at verse 14 and 15. 
And I would point this out. Complaining and bickering can hinder us in running the race. Let me say that again. Complaining and bickering can hinder us in running the race of life and also impede our happiness and joy. Look at verse 14. Paul says, do all things without complaining. And Wait a second, I have to take this jacket off. I can't do it. I have to just do this because I'm hot. Okay, we're done. All right, here we go. Look, look at verse 14 and 15. Do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Another translation of 14 and 15 goes as follows. Do everything readily and cheerfully. No bickering, no second guessing allowed. Go into the world uncorrupted, a breath of fresh air in this squalid and polluted society. Provide people with a glimpse of good living and the living God. I love that translation. Now when Paul uses the word complaining, a better way to translate it would be murmuring. It's not speaking of loud, boisterous screaming, but rather low-toned, discontented muttering. Does that make sense? So it's not a person who says, I don't like what's going on. It's more the person who's like this. I don't like what's going on. Do you like, do you like what's going on? I don't agree with that. Do you, do you agree with that? Don't you know they're always complaining? Sort of like Popeye. Remember Popeye? You ever watch a Popeye cartoon? He's always muttering. <laughs> what is he saying? No one knows, but he's muttering, right? That, that's the idea here. You know, and that's how some people are. They're always muttering or complaining or, or jumping to conclusions. I'm amazed how people will jump to conclusions. You know, the only exercise some Christians get is running down others and jumping to conclusions. They think they heard something, which maybe they didn't hear at all, or they misinterpreted it. Then they'll build a whole case on that thing that really uh, wasn't even true. And then they'll get angry about it and this confessor and go on for a long period of time. Don't let that be you. Heard a story of a man who decided to join a monastery and become a monk. And he had to take a vow of silence. And at the end of the year, he would be allowed to appear before the head priest, but he could only say two words. So after one year of being in this monastery, the monk said, bed's hard. Another year passes. He meets a head priest and he says, Food's cold. After the third year, he comes before the head priest and he says, I quit. The head priest says, well, it's no wonder. Since you've arrived, you've done nothing but complain. <laughs> but people are like this. And I found that people who like to complain are never happy to keep it to themselves. They kind of want to spread it around, you know. What do you think? Do you agree that, that we should do that? I don't think this is right, and that's just the sort of person they are. But yes, verse 14 says, do all things without disputing. This speaks of arguing. An argumentative person is always looking for fault and wrong with others. They're always looking for a verbal fight. Do you know any argumentative people? I do. They're just looking for a thing to get upset about. They just go from conflict to conflict. The Bible is saying, don't be that person. And this is the very opposite, in fact, of what a Christian ought to be. Because 1 Corinthians 13 says, love believes the best of every person. But some people believe the very worst about every person. They think their motives are always wrong and they're second guessing and challenging it. And then we are to also be blameless. Look at verse 15. Be blameless and harmless, children of God, without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. By the way, the word blameless means to be unblameable. Unblameable. In other words, people can't blame us because we don't do things wrong. It speaks of moral integrity manifesting itself externally. Of course, Jesus modeled this for us. He's able to turn to his accusers in John 8, 46, one day and say to them, can you prove me guilty of any sin? If I'm telling the truth, believe me, why don't you believe me? In other words, he's saying, hey, what have I done wrong? 
What sin have I committed? Well, there was none at all. You say, well, that was Jesus. Yeah, but what about Daniel the prophet? He was a guy just like us. And he was such a godly man that when his enemies wanted to trip him up because they were jealous of his power and influence with the king, we read in Daniel 6, 4, his enemies couldn't find anything to criticize or condemn because he was faithful, always responsible, and completely trustworthy. We are to be blameless. And the second word that is used here is be harmless. And a better way to translate this would be inexperienced in evil. I like that. Inexperienced in evil. This is not a stupid person. This is not a naive person. This is a person who is simply not chosen to be experienced in evil. Uh, this is the person who maybe when the dirty joke is told, they don't get it. Uh, what? Oh, sorry, your mind isn't perverse like everybody else, right? So this is the idea. And we are to be without fault, number three. It says in verse 15. This means no blemish or indication of disease. And you say, oh, well, Greg, you know, this is nice. You stand up there behind your stupid light-up pulpit and you tell us these things, you know, but I can't live at this level. And besides, God loves me and accepts me. It is lit up tonight, isn't it? Yeah, it is. okay, good. Because um, it is a light-up pulpit, right? You see, God accepts me and God loves me just as I am. God knows my heart. So I don't have to live at that level. Hold on, that can be an excuse. Yes, God accepts you as you are, but did you know he doesn't want to leave you that way? See, a lot of times in the name of God accepts me as I am, we continue in a path of maybe sinfulness. Or we never grow spiritually and we just rationalize it by saying, well, God accepts me and loves me as I am. But God wants you to grow up spiritually. God wants you to become more like Jesus. And remember, we already read in Philippians 2, it is God that works in you both to will and do of his good pleasure. God will not ask you to do anything. He will not give you the power to do. The calling of God is the enabling of God. And if we live this way, verse 15 says, we'll shine as lights in this perverse world. If you really want to see a light shine brightly, turn it on in a dark place. Let me put it another way. You ever see someone check their texts on their cell phone in a movie theater? I don't care how far away they are, it's noticeable and quite honestly, it's distracting. So in the same way, when we're a light, in a dark place, we really stand out from the crowd. And people notice us for sure. But it's very important, verse 16 says, holding forth the word of life so I may rejoice in the day of Christ. In other words, you don't want to just be a good example and not tell people why you're living the way that you're living. So someone might say to you, you know, I notice you're, you're a happy person. You're a kind person. You're always serving others. Um, what is it about you? Why do you live that way? Well, I, I believe in, you know, having a strong family and living by a set of morals. Really, where do you get your morals? I, I believe, what, tell them where you get them. I get them from the Bible. And by the way, I wasn't always this way. In fact, I was the opposite of this before. But Christ has come into my life and thank you for that compliment. But anything you see in me is a result of my relationship with Jesus Christ. See, we want them to know why we are the way that we are. And that's what uh, is being said here by Paul in Philippians, holding forth the word of life. Okay, so having said that, now let's shift gears and talk about this race we are to run. Very familiar words in verse 12 of Philippians 3. Paul says, not that I've already attained or I'm already perfected, but I press on that I may hold, lay hold of that for which Christ has laid hold of me. Brothers, I do not my count, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting the things which are behind and reaching forward to the things that are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many of us are mature, have this mind. And if any of you think otherwise, God will reveal this to you. So I started with the idea of the race of life. We're all in this race. 
We need to run this race to win. We've got to play by the rules. But what principles do we learn here about running the race of life? If you're taking notes, here's principle number one, and we put all of this on the screen so you can write it down. You must be dissatisfied with where you presently are spiritually. You must be dissatisfied with where you are presently are spiritually. Paul says in verse 12, it's not that I have attained or am already perfected. Another translation of verses 12 to 14 would go as follows. I'm not saying I have it all together or that I have it made, but I'm on my way reaching out for Christ who has wonderfully reached out for me. Friends, don't get me wrong. By no means do I count myself an expert in all this, but I have my eye on the goal where God is beckoning us onward to Jesus. I am off and running and I'm not turning back. You see, Paul was satisfied with Christ, but he wasn't satisfied with himself. So he's saying, I have a long ways to go. Do you realize that about yourself? Do you think you have a long ways to go? Or are you thinking, not me, man. I've arrived. Well, I'm sure you've made a lot of progress since you first believed, but oh my, it seems to me the more you know the Lord, the more you realize that you have a lot of changing to do. And if anyone could have thought that he had arrived, it would be the Apostle Paul. I mean, this is a man who has led countless people to Christ. He's established churches. He's written epistles, and yet He is saying, I have so much to learn and so far to go. Can you imagine a group of Christians sitting around with the Apostle Paul? Someone might say, well, you know what? God inspired me to share something with someone today. Another might say, the Lord led me to give the gospel to someone today. And Paul could say, well, God gave me inspired letters called epistles that make up half the Bible that will last forever. Oh, wow, okay, you win. I don't think Paul would have ever said that, but I'm just saying for a point, think of the comparison. Someone could say, oh, I heard God speak to me once. Another might say, well, I sensed his presence as we were worshiping the other day, and Paul said, well, actually, I died. I went to heaven, and then I came back from the dead to write more epistles. Oh, by the way, did I mention I raised someone from the dead? I mean, who can top this guy? This guy was at the top of his game, but yet he says, I have so far to go. And it's just a reminder that no longer how long you've known the Lord, uh, no matter how long you've known the Lord, I should say, there's always room for growth. And I think one of the problems is we become satisfied with where we are. And one of the reasons that you might be self-satisfied is you're comparing your running with that of other Christians. See, the other day I, I did a race with my grandchildren. They all wanted to race me. We want to race Papa. And uh, I thought, wow, this, I could lose today because a couple of them are getting older. But uh, we'll, we'll give it a go. So we picked a spot. My wife went a ways away, three feet. No, it's further. But, so we're all getting ready to run. And, and we take off. And, and I, I beat them. And, uh, and, you know, now that's so what? I beat a bunch of grandkids. You know, that's... Kind of sad. I should have let them win, but it was game on, okay? But that's the point. I beat children in a race, okay? So I can say, I'm pretty fast. Yeah, I beat old Christopher. He's four years old. Ah. So what? Now, if I raced with someone who was younger and athletic, I would have done horribly. If I would have raced against an athletic runner, if, if Hussein Bolt came over and we had a run together, uh, I would have done horribly. So my point is simply this. If I'm comparing myself to people much weaker than me, I'll always seem like I'm doing better. But if I compare myself with other people who are really running well, I'll see, oh man, I have a long ways to go. And that's what will happen. Well, I'm not as bad as that guy. Well, he died a year ago. I know I'm not as bad as him. Try comparing yourself with someone that's doing well. See, that sense of self-satisfaction is not a good thing. Paul did not compare himself with others. He compared himself with himself and with Jesus Christ. The plan here is progress, not perfection. We will never be perfect. 
ever. Point number two, get rid of extra weight and the things that would hinder you. Get rid of extra weight and the things that would hinder you. Verse seven, what things are gained to me? I counted loss for Christ. Yes, I count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Paul's saying, look, I'm looking back on my life. I was a pretty accomplished guy. You know, I was raised in an incredible family. Uh, I studied under Gamaliel, I, I knew culture, I knew languages, I knew scripture. I was an intellectual, I was an orator, I was a great debater. That stuff, to me now, it's rubbish. That's sort of the British word, I love the word rubbish, just rubbish, absolute rubbish. Actually, the word that Paul uses there for rubbish is uh, translated from a word that means excrement. If you don't know what that is, I'm talking about poop, folks, that's what I mean. So we could put it in another way, dog dung, if that makes you feel better. But you get the idea, right? That's what it is to me. All these accomplishments, it's like dog dung and the doggy bag. Who cares about it? I don't want it anymore. And then he says, but I'm, I'm laying aside this weight. Hebrews 12 says, lay aside the weight and the sin that so easily besets you in the race of life. We don't want excess baggage when we're running this race. This is hard for me because I am the, orig the original pack rat. I overpack. I don't even want to admit this, but I will. When we go on a trip, I take more stuff than my wife. I do. And it, it's just stuff. It's just things you don't need. Like, you know, we may need a vacuum cleaner. Let's put it in the suitcase and, and we need this and we need that. And you know, so I have all this stuff. Now sometimes my wife doesn't have a jacket and she, I don't have it. Well, I have four in my trunk, so aren't you glad that I'm a pack rat tonight, right? But um, so, you know, when I, I check in my luggage, I, I always cringe when they put it on the scale because I know it's going to weigh too much and they're going to look at me, give me that look like, loser. And then the, ex, then the little tag that says heavy, extra heavy, which is their way of saying, you are so lame, we hate you, you know? So... I overpack, I take too much stuff, that's just the way that I am. Well, in the race of life, we wanna run as lightly as possible. So you need to ask yourself periodically, as you're running this race, as you're walking with Christ, is there someone or is there something that's slowing you down? See, if I'm on a diet and I'm hanging out with a person that likes to eat pizza and Mexican food 24 seven, they're a bad influence on me. It's better if I'm with someone else who's on a diet, maybe even the same diet, and we'll kind of hold each other accountable. But I'll tell you what, if I'm watching someone else eat, it's torment to me, okay? I want what they have. So maybe there's someone who's a bad influence on you spiritually. You know, you're trying to walk with God, but when you're around them, they're saying, oh, come on, chill out, relax. Let's try this, let's do that. They're not a good influence. Or there's something that's slowing you down. Maybe it's something you're doing that's impeding your spiritual performance. In the book of Genesis, we have the story of Abraham. God told him to leave his homeland and go to a land that the Lord would reveal to him and also to leave his family. And Abraham obeyed, sort of. He brought along his nephew Lot, who was like a spiritual dead weight on him. And it caused a lot of friction and a lot of problems. And finally, after a conflict developed, Abraham and Lot parted ways. And then the Lord spoke to Abraham again. My point is, Lot was a bad influence on Abraham. And is there someone that's a bad influence on you? Or even worse, are you a bad influence on someone else? Don't be that person. Be a good influence. Because we're running the race, and we wanna run the race well. We wanna run from what is wrong, we wanna run toward what is right, and we wanna run with like-minded people. What is the theme of the book of Philippians? Happiness, yes, that's the title of the series. Happiness, Paul refers to it many times with different words, rejoicing, joy, etc. And if you wanna be a happy person, there are certain things you should do and there are certain things you shouldn't do. 
Psalm 1 sums it up perfectly. It says, happy or blessed, happy is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly or stands in the way of sinners or sits in the seat of the scornful. So if you want to be a happy person, don't hang around ungodly people who will influence you to do ungodly things. But happiness is not comprised merely of what we don't do. It's also comprised of what we do do. I didn't mean to say do do, but you know what I'm saying, right? Because someone's focusing, he said do do. Yeah, okay, I did. You caught me. So I don't walk in the counseling of the ungodly. I don't stand the way of sinners, but instead I get into the word of God. It says his delight is in the law or the word of the Lord, and in it does he meditate day and night. So if you want to be happy, stay away from godless people doing godless things, leading you away from God, and hang around godly people and get into God's word. That's what we're doing here tonight. So periodically I have to ask myself the question, this thing that I'm doing, is it a wing or is it a weight? Is it a wing or is it a weight? Is it speeding me up or slowing me down? Is it building me up or is it tearing me down? And check this out, what may be a weight to one may not necessarily be a weight to another. Lay aside the sin or the weight and the sin that so easily besets you. See, one thing might slow one person down more than it slows another person down. Like we have different metabolisms, right? And some people can eat whatever they want and never gain weight. I hate those people. No, I don't. I love them. Because I'm not to hate. I am to love. I love them. But I, I'm upset they have that metabolism. <laughs> I want their metabolism. I mean, I used to eat things when I was younger. Had no effect on me. I, after church, when we were starting our church many years ago, there was a takeout restaurant. I've mentioned this before called Noggles. Anybody remember Noggles? Wow, a lot of you. It was really good. It was really good takeout Mexican food. So they had a thing called a Macho Combo Burrito. This thing was so stinking big. It was the size of a sleeping bag, okay? <laughs> it was just massive burrito. And so after church, I would eat it. And, and even when I'm preaching, I'm getting toward the end of my sermon, I'm thinking, macho combo burrito, macho combo burrito. <laughs> Preachers think these things, trust me. Uh, I'm, I so, I'm, yes, I want the Lord to bless, but macho combo burrito too, you know. <laughs> so I'd be done with church, I'd drive over, I'd order the macho combo burrito, eat it, fantastic, no issues, no problems. I couldn't even look at a macho combo burrito today. I'd gain weight looking at it. And for sure I would get acid reflux from eating it late at night. I've gone from acid rock to acid reflux. It's a very sad thing. But then somebody else could go and eat that and it wouldn't affect them at all. I say that's not fair. Well, I don't know if it's fair or not. But you just need to know what you can do and what you can't do, okay? So just because they can do it doesn't mean you should do it. And so you have to ask yourself, is that thing slowing me down? Number three, in the race of life, we must run with the right motive. Run with the right motive. Paul speaks of only one receiving the prize, running for the gold, if you will. I mean, I don't think most Olympians want to win the bronze. I mean, the bronze is great. I'd be thrilled if I won the bronze. <laughs> but the gold's better. Everybody knows it. Silver's good too, but the gold's best. Because if you win gold, you get the top position and they play the national anthem of your country. So you run for the top award. But our primary motive is not running for an award or a reward, but there are rewards promised to Christians. But our primary motive is found in Philippians 3.10. Paul says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. That's our motive, that I may know him. The Amplified Translation, which is an expanded Greek translation, states that verse as follows. Paul speaking, my determined purpose in life is that I may know him, then he defines what that means, that I may progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him, perceiving and recognizing and understanding the wonders of his person more strongly and more clearly. That I may know him. Our mission statement at Harvest 
is knowing God and making him known. Paul saying, my determined purpose in life is to know him. Notice he says, it's to know him. He doesn't say it's to know about him. Now you need to know about God. But that should not take the place of knowing God. We know a lot about a lot of people. Uh, we have a celebrity obsessed culture today. You know, media breathlessly follows uh, their every step. Here's a celebrity coming out of Starbucks. Here's a celebrity going to lunch. Here's a celebrity going to rehab. Here they are going to lunch and back to rehab and to dinner and back to rehab and here they are. And aren't they wonderful and look at them. And you know, so we watch them and maybe we follow them on Facebook. We say, yeah, I'm, I'm friends with them on Facebook. I know them. You're not their friend. They have 10 million followers or friends. You're not their friend. I, I know, but I have a picture they posted. You're not their friend. You know about them. And I fear that a lot of people know about God instead of knowing God. They can say things about God. Even say things from scripture, but is there that deep fellowship and relationship with him? Jesus said, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? In your name did we not cast out demons? In your name did we not do wonderful miracles. And then Jesus says, I will say to them, I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. They knew about Jesus, but he didn't know them at all. Number four, Paul had a clear objective and focus in life. Paul had a clear objective and focus in life. Verse 13, this one thing I do. David, of course, had it as well. We brought this up when we looked at his life recently. He said, one thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Mary of Mary and Martha fame also had this one thing in her life. The Lord came over to their home for a meal and Martha was frantically trying to prepare something in the kitchen and uh, she got upset because Mary wasn't helping her. And so she complained to Jesus, and I love what the Lord says. Martha, you're so upset about all these details. He says, there's only one thing worth being concerned about right now, and Mary has discovered it. Don't take it from her. Martha, I appreciate it. I love your meals. You're a fantastic chef. But you know what? Mary's kind of tuned into what really matters. Right now, we're talking together. So if you were smart, you'd take off the apron and sit down and listen in. Sure, you'd learn something. So sometimes, you know, we're all frantic and all these things. We're doing many things. Let's not forget the one thing. Sometimes the many things can take the place of the one thing. And as I've often said, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Principle number five, we're almost done here. Don't look back. Don't look back. Have you ever tried to run and look over your shoulder behind you? More than one race has been lost when the person who was in the lead position could not avoid the temptation to see if that other person was there, and boom, they hit the finish line or the ribbon just a little bit before. So we can't look back. Paul says in verse 13, forgetting the things that are behind and reaching forward to the things that are before. What does that mean? To forget does not mean to fail to remember. I mean, there are things that I remember that I can't necessarily forget. When Paul uses this word uh, forget, it means don't be influenced or affected by it any longer. I read an interesting article in the paper about a group in New York City that decided to shred their regrets uh, for New Year's. So they brought photos of ex-boyfriends, bad medical reports, stacks of unpaid bills. They put them all in a giant shredder in Times Square where a garbage truck would cart them off forever. And in the article, one person was quoted to say, I feel liberated after shoving a photo of her ex-fiance with his new girlfriend into the industrial size machine, the article says. Another lady visiting from Ecuador sees the opportunity to banish three unpleasant thoughts, her high cholesterol, her high blood pressure, and her bills. So that's fun, but guess what? <laughs> the bills still have to be paid, and you probably still have high blood pressure, and your boyfriend is still with that girl. <laughs> now you can shred all you want. It's a nice sentiment, 
but it isn't gonna change anything. But when the Bible says we can forget these things, it means we don't have to be influenced by them any longer. And to be effectively forgetting something, I must first be forgiven. There can be no forgetting without forgiveness. For the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 3.15, God requires that which is past. Because God forgives and forgets, we can do the same. Let me say that again, because God forgives and forgets, we can do the same because the Lord says, there's sins and iniquities while I remember no more. Now this does not mean that God is having a lapse in memory. What God is saying is, I'll no longer hold your sin against you. In other words, your sins no longer affect your standing with me or influence my attitude toward you. Let me say it again. When the Lord says your sins and iniquities will I remember no more, he is saying that your sins do not affect your standing with me or influence my attitude toward you. To forget means we break the power of the past by living for the future. Put things behind you. Jesus said, remember Lot's wife. Why should I remember Lot's wife? Ah, because she made a big mistake. You remember her story? God was delivering Lot and his wife and his family out of Sodom and Gomorrah, which he was judging. And the angel of the Lord said, come on, this is the way out, and don't look back. All right? So they're walking away, and now God's judgment is raining on the city, and quite honestly, that would be very tempting to look at, okay? So we might say, God's being a little hard on Lot's wife. I mean, she looked back. Yeah, she looked back, and the Bible says she became a pillar of salt. So she's like walking along. She looks, you know, frozen in time. Like one of those people at Pompeii that were caught in the uh, explosion of lava from, I think, Mount Vesuvius. Uh, but anyway, so this is Lot's wife looking back. But it's interesting because the phrase that is used for her looking back means to look with longing. It was deliberate. It's not just, oh, wow. No, it's like, <laughs> I'm looking and I'm gonna look if I'm supposed to or not. It's intentional. Have you ever looked at something with longing? Coming back to Krispy Kreme. <laughs> Have you ever walked in there when the signs lit up and see those little glistening donuts come down the little conveyor belt? Here they come. First they, you know, they go in the little grease thing, get kind of cooked on the, now the glaze, they just wait. You just wait for them. It's amazing. And you look with longing, at least I do. Or you go to the pet store and you see that cute dog. Oh, I want him. You look with longing. Or you walk through the mall and you see the cute outfit in the window. You look with longing. Or you look at something else. The idea is that's what she was doing. Don't look back. Jesus said, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. So look, if you're gonna run the race of life, you need to put the past behind you. Stop living in the past. Don't revisit the so-called good old days because that's what defeated Israel in the wilderness. Remember they say, oh, we remember the old days back in Egypt when, you know, we used to eat garlics and leeks and onions and all we have is this stinking manna. We're so sick of it. Garlics, leeks, and onions, man, their breath must have stunk. <laughs> but they had sort of taken the life of bondage in Egypt under the whip of the Pharaoh and, and sort of imagined it as the greatest life ever when it was the worst life ever. And sometimes, you know, when we've turned our back on our old life or we're walking with Christ, the devil will come to you and maybe bring back one of those memories where you had a little fun. Hey, remember that time <laughs> that this happened? You're like, yeah. <laughs> I remember. Yeah, my old girlfriend. Oh, I remember my old girlfriend. I'm gonna look her up on Facebook. Who's that old lady? I'm as old as she is. Don't live in the past. Live in the moment and look to the future. The devil won't remember of the misery you used to have. He won't say, hey, remember that time, you know, you drank a lot and you threw up all over the place? Remember that? No. Hey, remember that time you were so despondent you actually thought of killing yourself? Remember that? No, he won't remind you of that. He'll remind you of a few fleeting pleasures. 
Because the first step to going back is looking back. You see? So forgetting the things that are behind and reaching forward to the things that are before. Let me add one other thing to this forgetting the past. It's also forgetting past victories. And by that, I think it's a good thing to reflect back on what the Lord has done. But listen to this. Sometimes successes are harder for people to get over than failures. What do I mean by that? Success is, oh man, we had this great success. It was just fantastic. Okay, good, but uh, that was then and this is now. And I'll have people come up to me and say, oh man, remember the old days, the old days, Jesus movement days. Remember those days? Yeah, those are awesome days. Remember that? It was so great. Yeah. Wow, just remember, hey, you know what? That was like over 40 years ago. God's doing some amazing stuff right here, right now, and I'm excited about that. And I'm looking forward to what the Lord will do. So let's sum up and conclude. Number one, you must be dissatisfied with where you are. Number two, get rid of extra weight and things that would hinder you. Thirdly, run with the right motive. Fourth, have a clear objective and focus. Five, don't look back. One last point and I'm done. You must press on even when it gets hard in the race of life. If you want to be a happy person, press on when it gets hard. Hey, you'll be happy after you win the race. Oh, you know when you're, you're running a race and if it's a long distance run and you're in the last lap, it's like your arms and legs are made out of rubber. You feel like your heart is gonna burst out of your chest. You can't even imagine finishing this, but somehow you press on and then you win. And then you know what? It was all worth it, wasn't it? Even though you wanted to walk off that track, even though you wanted to quit that race, press on. Verse 13, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The word that he uses there for pressing comes from the Greek word agonizo. <laughs> Can you guess what English word we get from that? Agonize. Yes, sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's painful. But what's that expression? No pain, no gain? That's true in the spiritual life too, to some degree. Yeah, the theme of Philippians is happiness and joy. 19 times in four chapters, Paul mentions joy, rejoicing, or gladness. And that includes running and finishing the race of life. Paul said to his friends at the church of Ephesus in Acts 20, 24, I want to finish my race with joy. Finish my race with joy. Listen, it's not enough to start the race of life. We must finish it. Otherwise, we've been running in vain. In his last epistle, the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 4, 7, I fought a good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. Henceforth, there remains a crown of righteousness for me and all who love his appearing. That's the objective. You finish this race that you have begun. Okay, let's be honest. How many of you have a problem with worry? Raise your hand up. Would any of you describe yourselves as a worry wart? You're very prone to worry. Raise your hand up. I'm not gonna mock you. I get that. Uh, we all know what it's like to be gripped by fear. You know the feeling when your blood goes cold, shiver down the spine, hair standing up on the back of your head. For me, that's singular. I only have one hair on my head. Uh, your stomach sinks, your mouth goes dry. What amazes me is uh, people will pay good money to be frightened. You know, we'll go to that scary movie because we, we want to be scared out of our words. So we'll go on that radical roller coaster. I, I pretty much gave up roller coasters a, a while ago. Uh, I'd gone to Magic Mountain a few times. And those are not roller coasters there. Those are torture devices, Okay. Uh, and I said, I'm not going there anymore. I'm just going to go back to Disneyland, you know, and I'll ride the rides there. And then even last time I was at Disneyland, I rode the Matterhorn, which has been there forever, ever since I've been a kid. And I'm thinking, does this thing have suspension or what? I, just, I felt every bump, you know. And, and so now I'm on the storybook land ride where you <laughs> go through the mouth of Monstro and you just cruise very slowly. But, uh, you know, we'll pay money to be frightened. We, we enjoy being frightened, but 
Then there's another emotion that is paired with fear and that of course is worry. And there's a lot of things that one can worry about, especially today. The state of our country, the safety of our country, the economy, terrorism. Nowadays we even worry a bit like about, uh, we worry a bit about war. Uh, I mentioned earlier that there was the number one Google search. I don't know if it's still the number one Google search, but for a few moments, the number one Google search was, is World War III close? So there are things that are scary. A Time Magazine did an interesting article on the topic of fear, and they said the following. You might worry about flying, but did you know that 600 Americans each year die from falling out of their beds? Then there's the fatal plunge down the stairs, the bite of sausage lodged in your throat, the tumble on the slippery sidewalk as you leave the house, and those are things you should be afraid of. So I figure, well, as long as you don't eat, sleep, or go downstairs and walk on sidewalks, you're good, right? Uh, And then there's the fear of sharks. Have you heard there's a lot of sharks out right now? There's a video I saw earlier today. Uh, It's from the helicopter from the Orange County Sheriff's Department, they made this announcement. These are people paddle boarding, and they they made this announcement very calmly. They said, you are paddling, you that are paddle boarding, next to you are 15 great white sharks. And then they say, we advise you to get out of the water calmly. I'm like, (laughs) what? I'm out there paddle boarding, it's a great day. 50, I mean, one great white is bad. Two is even worse. Three is just earth shattering. 15 great white sharks. I mean, they should have just, I mean, maybe put a little more energy into it. They were so calm. We advise you to leave the water calmly. They should have just said, shark! Or, or better yet, uh, you that are paddle boarding. Near you are 15 great white sharks. You are going to die Pray this prayer after me. (laughs) Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. I mean, that'd be pretty accurate. But uh, here's a funny thing about shark attacks. There's nothing funny about shark attacks, but an interesting stat, I should say. Did you know more people die from taking selfies than people dying from being attacked by sharks? That's absolutely true. How do you die from taking a selfie? You take selfies in dangerous places. The most recent I read about, a tourist fell down the stairs of the Taj Mahal snapping a selfie. So, you know, there's a lot of things to be afraid of in life. And then there are personal fears and worries. Fear for the safety of your family. Fear that you'll be able to pay your bills. Fear uh, that, or that fear that you won't be able to pay your bills, I should say. Fear for your children. Uh, so what's bothering you? What is causing you anxiety? I read that a, a study was done and people asked, what do you worry about the most? I was surprised by the answer. It wasn't nuclear war. It wasn't shark attacks. The number one fear of most people was my appearance. Really? My appearance. Oh, you know, I may die in a nuclear blast, but how do I look in this outfit? Does this make me look fat, right? I mean, crazy, the things that we'll think about. There's a lot of things that people do worry about. Modern medical research has proved that worrying is actually harmful to you physically because it breaks down your resistance to disease. Uh, Experts tell us that worry diseases the nervous system specifically the digestive organs and the heart. It was revealed that 79 to 90% of all visits to primary care physicians are stress-related complaints. And I just had one of these incidents. I'm a pretty healthy guy, but I was feeling kind of pressure around in my chest. And I thought, wow, am I having a heart issue? So then I Googled you know, signs of a heart attack, pressure around your chest. Yeah, I feel that shortness of breath. All of a sudden, I'm like, <laughs> slight nausea. Oh, I mean, I'm, t- I'm t- literally, I'm feeling these things as I'm reading this. So I, I call my doctor. I got to come down there. I'm not the guy that goes to my doctor over any- everything, but I had this little bit of pressure. And uh, so I went down. They did an EKG in me. He says, you're fine. And I walked out there feeling good again. I'm telling you, I psyched myself into it. 
Now, if you do feel any of those signs, you should go see a doctor. My doctor said it was good that you came to see me, but you are such an idiot. No, he didn't say that. But, uh, but a lot of times we psych ourselves into things. Charles Mayo, the founder of the famed Mayo Clinic, said he never knew anyone who died of overwork, but he knew many who died of worry. Isn't that interesting? And here's what worry is, because a lot of times we'll rationalize it. Well, it's just because I care. Now listen to this. Worry can actually be a sin. It really can. Because to worry is really a failure to trust God. The word worry comes from an old German word that means to choke or strangle. I was playing with my grandson today and he was coming up from behind. He's getting pretty strong and choking me. He thought that was a lot of fun. And uh, I had to, no, don't choke Papa, you know. And that's what worry does. It chokes you out. And it makes things worse. Because when you worry about the future, you cripple yourself in the present. Let me say that again. When you worry about the future, you cripple yourself in the present. Listen, worrying does not empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It empties today of its strength. And that is why Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. There's an old fable that's told of a man who came face to face with the dangers of worry. One day he was walking toward his town and and the man uh, saw death, excuse me, one day death was walking toward his town. It's a fable, right? Okay, so this didn't really happen, so you're not alarmed. Death was walking toward his town. The man stopped death and said, excuse me, what are you gonna do? Death said, I'm gonna go into town and I'm gonna take 100 people. And the man ran ahead of death and warned everyone that death was coming. As evening fell, he met death again. And the man said, you said you were going to take a hundred people. Why did a thousand people die? Death responded, I only took a hundred. Worry took the rest. And that's how worry works. It just whips us into a frenzy. You could write this epitaph on many American tombstones, hurried, worried, buried. You know, I kind of like the way Australians view life. How many of you have been to Australia? It's a beautiful country. And uh, they have this expression they use. And the expression is, no worries, mate. So uh, you'll ask someone for directions. Hey, do you know the way to this place? Yeah, they'll say, right, go on down there and then chin right over here. And <laughs> you might see a kangaroo and get into a boxing match with him, you know. And throw another shrimp on the barbie. And then they'll say all that stuff. And then they'll say, hey, no worries, mate. No worries, mate. I like that. No worries, mate, nothing to worry about. And in a way, that's theologically correct. It's been said, worry is the advance interest you pay on troubles that seldom come. Worry is the advance interest you pay on troubles that seldom come. So what is the cure to worry? I have no idea. Good night and God bless. <laughs> All right, there is a cure and it's right here in the Bible. Philippians 4, let's read it together. Philippians 4, starting in verse 4, Paul writes, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I love those verses, don't you? And by the way, Paul was not in some ivory tower spinning off in practical theories. Remember that Paul wrote this under house arrest. He's under house arrest. He's constrained. He cannot come and go as he pleases. And yet the theme of this book, the book of Philippians, is happiness and joy and rejoicing. How can you be happy under circumstances like that, because circumstantially, Paul had nothing to be rejoicing about. I mean, he went to Rome initially uh, to be a preacher, and he ended up there as a prisoner, and he didn't know what the future held. You know, he might be acquitted, and he might be beheaded, and then if that wasn't bad enough, some of the believers were turning against him. Some were for Paul, some were against Paul, 
But instead of worrying, Paul was rejoicing and living in great peace. And now he gives to us the secret of victory over worry. He says, don't be anxious for anything. In verse 6. By the way, the word anxious means to be pulled in different directions. Don't be anxious for anything. Our hopes pull us in one direction. Our fears pull us in the other. He says, don't be anxious for anything. So what am I supposed to do? Don't be pulled in different directions. What do I do instead? This is very important. Verse four, rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. Let's say that together. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. So what are you going through right now? What are you facing right now? Here's what the Bible says you should do. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. I love how he says, and again I say, did you hear what I said? Rejoice in the Lord always. Oh, by the way, did you hear that? Again I say rejoice. Just do that. Yeah, but Craig, it's easy for you to say standing up there. You know, I'm going through hardship. He didn't say rejoice in circumstances always. He said rejoice in the Lord always. That's the key. And by the way, in the original language, it's a command. The Lord's not saying, hey, you know, if you're in a good mood, things are going well, if all the bills are paid and the sky's blue, would you mind rejoicing in me always? No, God says, I command you to rejoice in me always. It's a scriptural command. And to not rejoice is disobedience to God. We justify worry in a number of ways, but in fact, God commands us to rejoice. And you know what? Some Christians need to just lighten up a little bit. You know, some believers, they're just always down on something. They have no sense of humor. We all know these people like Debbie Downer. Here comes Debbie Downer. Debbie Downer. Hey, how's it going? Oh, it's okay. I just have a burden from the Lord. Hey, Debbie Downer, when's the last time you smiled? I don't know, but I'm just so burdened. And here comes Bobby Buzzkill right after <laughs> Debbie Downer. And Bobby Buzzkill, you know, he loves to quote scriptures out of context, right? Scriptures out of context. I'd be like, Oh man, Bobby, check out that incredible swell. Isn't God good? Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. <laughs> Bobby, that, I don't know if that really relates to a nice set of waves. I, yeah, we'll love not the world. Hey, Bobby, I was just sharing the gospel with a friend the other day. And be not unequally yoked together with non believers. Well, <laughs> Bobby Buskill, I'm not yoked. I'm just talking to him about Jesus for what fellowship does light have with darkness. Bobby, listen. <laughs> How am I going to reach people if I don't talk to them about Jesus? Come up from among them and be separate. Now I'm going to separate your head from your body, Bobby Buskin. <laughs> you need to chill. You need to lighten up. You know, some people just have this personality, then they blame it on their Christian faith. It has nothing to do with Christianity. This is just because you are a drag. Stop being that person. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Paul had the worst circumstances imaginable. And he's saying that certainly you can rejoice and I can rejoice. Solomon writes in Proverbs 15, 15, a cheerful heart has a continual feast. Isn't a great picture? A cheerful heart, a happy person is always having a great meal, an affected saying. You know, it's all about your attitude and the way that you look at things. Any idiot can be happy when things are going reasonably well. <laughs> and there are even people that have things going very well and still they're miserable. But the Christian can rejoice when things are going well. The Christian can rejoice when things are not going well. The Christian can even rejoice when they're being persecuted. Listen to this passage, Habakkuk 3.17. Even though the fig trees have no blossoms and there are no grapes on the vine, even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty, yet, he writes, I will rejoice in the Lord. I'll be joyful in the God of my salvation. Hey, we could update that verse along these lines. Even though the economy is bad and they're downsizing at work, my insurance rates are up and the car's out of gas. 
I'll be joyful and the God of my salvation. See, it's not about circumstances. This is about you and God. It's rejoicing in God, not in the way you feel. It's rejoicing in God, not in how well things are going. It's rejoicing in the Lord always. I mean, look at Paul and Silas who were in prison for preaching the gospel. Their backs were torn open with a Roman whip. Their feet were fastened in heavy metal stocks. And Acts 16, 25 says, at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises to God and the prisoners heard them. And this happened at midnight, I love that. When you're in pain, the midnight hour is not the easiest time for a worship service, is it? Nor is the doctor's office when you're waiting for those lab tests. Nor is the hospital room when you're waiting for your loved one who's having surgery or a thousand other scenarios I could cite. So what are we to do? There are three steps you need to take if you want to find the cure for worry. How many of you want the cure for worry? Raise your hand. Okay, then write these notes down. Write these words down. Right praying. Right praying. The next time you're tempted to worry, Pray instead. We need to get into the habit of turning to God when we feel worry approaching so it will become a conditioned reflex. There's a difference between a normal and a conditioned reflex. A normal reflex, no one has to teach it to you. If even the smallest child touches something that's hot, they pull back. Maybe they scream, maybe they cry, but they naturally know to pull away from something that causes pain. You didn't have to teach your child to do that. They knew to do that already. Reminds me of the story of the guy who went to a doctor with two burned ears. Two burned ears. The doctor said, sir, I've never seen anything like this. Both of your ears are burned very badly. How did this happen? The man said, well, doc, I was ironing and my phone rang and I answered the iron instead of the phone. The doctor said, that's horrible. I get it, you burn one ear, but what happened to the other? Well, he called back. So, how many of you have heard that joke before? Okay. How many of you are sick of the joke? You never want to hear it again. How many of you have never heard that joke? You've never heard it. How many of you are tired of raising your hand? Okay, so that's an, uh, you know, an automatic reflex. I touch a hot iron, I pull back. Then there's a condition reflex. Uh, it's something we learn. For instance, when we sing the Star Spangled Banner, we stand up, right? Or maybe when we say the Pledge of Allegiance, we put our hand over our heart. Or when we pray, we bow our head in reverence. We don't have to bow our head. We don't have to close our eyes, but it's an act of reverence. It's something we've learned to do. And see, it, there are things that you learn to do, and then later they come naturally. Like, do you remember when you first learned how to drive? I failed my driving test three times. Did anybody else fail their driving test? It was horrible. And I, just, and I always got the same instructor and I got so psyched out. And I really had trouble with that parallel parking, right? I remember that. But, uh, and I remember when I first drove a car, especially when it was a, um, a, you know, a stick shift and manual transmission. So, you know, I had to think about everything. It's like, okay, let's see, clutch goes in, uh, put it in gear, let out gas, and then shift with the clutch in, and now, now shift, oh wait, brake, brake is different than clutch, don't hit clutch instead of brake, and you know, you're figuring it all out. You're conscious, turn right, turn on the little turning signal, here we go, turn it on, now turn, turn, turn off the turning signal, you know, okay, here we go, look in rear view mirror, you think about all that stuff. Do you think about all that when you drive your car now? You just get in your car, drive, check your cell phone, send texts, <laughs> which you should not do. You know, you're running your radio now. You're making a call now. You're eating a burrito, sometimes all at the same time. <laughs> you're shifting or you've got automatic transmission, whatever. But now it all comes naturally. But it didn't come naturally at first. You taught yourself how to do it. You say, well, Greg, I have no idea what you're, why are you telling us this? This is how we need to deal with things that frighten us. We need to teach ourselves to pray. It's not natural. When something scary happens, when there's a threat against your life or, or something is said to you that alarms you, the natural inclination is to freak out, right? But the spiritual reaction should be to pray. 
So someone says, just happened. Let's just pray about it right now. Let's just everybody bow our head. Let's pray right now. Start teaching yourself to do that. And here's another thing. Instead of panicking, you <clears throat> pray. Instead of worrying, you pray. You intentionally place the matter in God's hands. As someone wisely said, quote, when your knees start knocking, kneel on them. Often when we face adversity, the first thing we turn to are friends. Oh, you know, I need your help, I need your encouragement, or I need a loan, or whatever it is you need. You go, and there's nothing wrong with having friends and asking for their help, but honestly, the first place you should turn is to God in prayer. Oh, Lord, help me. Oh, Lord, I don't know what to do here. Lord, I need your wisdom in this situation. And notice that Paul says, in everything by prayer. In everything by prayer, verse six, and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Notice he does not say, and only the big, gnarly things by prayer. Because you know what? Everything should be brought before the Lord. And by the way, nothing is too big to pray about, and nothing is too small to pray about. Because sometimes small things ultimately turn into big things. You know, when our children are, are small, we we may not pray for them all that much because we're watching over them. Uh, you know, we of course hope no harm comes to them and we're concerned for them, but maybe we don't pray for them as fervently as we do when they enter the preteen years because nowadays the preteen years are like the teen years. And they're like little miniature teenagers already and, and all these things are happening with them and, and they have an interest in things maybe they shouldn't have an interest in or they're saying and doing things that alarm you. Well, you should pray for them for when they're little. You should pray for them when they're preteen. Pray for them when they're teenagers. Pray for them when they're young adults. You never stop praying for your kids, even when they're adults. And you're getting older now. Pray for them that they'll take care of you. <laughs> but... Never stop praying. That's why we read that the mothers kept bringing their children to Jesus. They were rebuffed by some of the disciples. Don't bother Jesus. He's busy. Do you have an appointment? The moms are like, no, we're bringing our kids to Jesus. And Jesus said, you let those little children come on to me for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Are you having problems with your kids right now? Start praying about it. Stop worrying about it. Start praying about it and get other people to pray with you. That's what we need to be doing in everything, verse five says, by prayer. Let your requests be made known to God. And notice it says, with thanksgiving. With thanksgiving. It doesn't say, <clears throat> excuse me, offer thanksgiving after the prayer is answered in the affirmative, but rather it says, in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. I think an excellent example of this is Daniel the prophet. Of course, a, a law had been passed that nobody could pray uh, to any god except the king. And Daniel heard about that and he went and prayed anyway. And the Bible says that in Daniel 6.10, he, he prayed and gave thanks before his God. What? Gave thanks? It would have made more sense if we read it and Daniel screamed in fear out to God. Nobody, he gave thanks. Lord, you're in control. See, when I give thanks, I'm just reminding myself that God is in control. And the Lord's Prayer, which is really the template model and model for all prayer, Jesus said, after this manner, therefore, you should pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and on it goes. But notice the prayer starts, our Father who art in heaven, set apart and glorified be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So before I offer a single prayer of petition, I just acknowledge the power, the sovereignty of God. And that's important because it puts your problems into perspective. So in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. What does this mean, supplication? Supplication is when you pray for others. Supplication is when you pray for others. So when you're gripped with fear and worry, I need to focus on God and others. Prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving. Here's a way to sort of remember 
how to pray. It's summed up in an acronym, A-C-T-S, ACTS. So sort of an idea of how you should pray. A stands for adoration. C stands for confession. T stands for thanksgiving. S stands for supplication. So think about this. When you're praying, always, when possible, start with adoration. Just offer praise to God. Rejoice in the Lord. God's in control. Then confession. Confessing any personal sin. And then thirdly, uh, there's thanksgiving. Thanking God for all that he's done in your life and then supplication where I'm praying for others. So if you want to find God's cure for worry, it's right praying. And number two, it's right thinking. Right thinking. Look at verse eight. Finally, brothers, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, Meditate on these things. Another translation of that verse goes as follows. Summing it all up, my friends, I'd say you will do your best by filling your minds and meditating on things that are true and noble and reputable and authentic and compelling and gracious. The best, not the worst. The beautiful, not the ugly. Things to praise, not things to curse. Listen to this. Maintaining personal peace involves the heart and the mind. You have to learn how to think biblically. Isaiah 26, 3 says, You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. That's King James. Your mind is stayed on God because your emotions can mislead you. Do you know that? You can't trust your emotions. People that say, well, I, you know, I just, I want to go with my heart, man, my heart. And God knows what's in my heart, my heart. Stop with the heart. Let me tell you something about your stinking heart. The Bible says, it's deceitfully wicked above, of all things, above all things. Who can know it? So don't say God knows what's in your heart. That's the problem. Your heart is dark. My heart is dark. Well, my heart says, well, yeah, but what does the Bible say? Well, my heart tells me it's okay. What does the Bible say? Does the Bible say it's okay? I don't care what your heart tells you. Learn how to think biblically, not emotionally. So it's right praying and it's right thinking. And Paul gives us a very clear focus on what we pray about. Now, look, I've put this biblical principle to the test. The worst day of our life was when our son Christopher died in an automobile accident. I, I mean, your, your life has changed overnight. It's very hard to comprehend the death of a child. Uh, you never plan for it. You never play it out in your mind. At least I never did. And I was in a state of shock initially. And I mean, that night, how do you go to bed? Like, you know, oh, I'm going to go to bed now. And just wake up tomorrow. Wait, wait, what? Uh, I'll just have a meal. No, I didn't want a meal. I didn't want to go to bed. I was just in complete anxiety, like cranked up to a hundred. And I didn't know what to do. I couldn't sleep. I'd sleep for three minutes and wake up. I felt like I was living a nightmare. So I came back to Philippians 4 eight. Whatsoever things are true and lovely and of good report. And I sort of set this little, what I call a grid of grace up. A grid of grace. And the idea is I would run all of my thoughts through this grid of grace or through Philippians 4.8. And when these thoughts of anxiety or these thoughts of fear or these other thoughts would come into my mind, I'd ask myself the question, is this true? But I'm thinking, is it true? Uh, is it helpful? Is it pure and lovely? Or is it ugly? Is it the worst? And if it was not pure, if it was not true, I would reject it. I would say, I'm not going to let that thought in, and I'm going to let another thought come in in its place. Say, I don't get what you're saying. Okay, so a thought comes. You'll never see your son again. You'll never hear his voice again. Okay, that's a thought. How do you refute a thought like that? Wow, that's kind of true in one sense. But then I come back with this thought. 
My son is more alive than he's ever been because Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life, and he that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. So this thought, you're out of here. This other thought, you come on in. See, I replace one thought with another. That's learning to think biblically. It really matters what you think about. Just as it matters what you eat, right? Certain foods have a certain effect on you. You know, they say there are brain foods that encourage, you know, help you think better and other things obviously have the opposite effect. The same is true of thoughts. I let certain thoughts in that can take me down. Other thoughts can build me up because what you think about ultimately affects what you do. Because Proverbs 23, 7 says, as a man thinks, so is he. You remember the first temptation in the garden was when Satan came to Eve and Genesis 3, 1 says, The serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Notice he doesn't come to her and say, Hi, I'm the devil. Maybe you've heard about me. I'm going to hell one day. I hate you. I want to destroy your life. So, want to hang out? Well, who's going to do that? Nobody comes subtly like a serpent when you least expect it. And the same happens with us. He comes with these thoughts. In fact, we're told in 2 Corinthians 11, I'm afraid as the serpent deceived Eve in his craftiness, your mind should be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. See, the devil will come to you and say, look, I know you would never do this, but why don't you just fantasize about it? I know you would never do this, but just entertain this thought for a little while. Because the devil knows the first step to doing something wrong is getting you to think about something that is wrong. And that's why you got to keep the door closed to thoughts that are harmful. And we're told over in 2 Corinthians 10, bring every thought into the captivity of the obedience of Jesus Christ. So the next time you're troubled, the next time you're afraid, I have a suggestion for you. Try talking to yourself. Some of you are thinking, now I know you've lost your mind. <laughs> you're telling me to talk to myself. Yes, I, I am. In a way, I am. But I'm also telling you to talk to the devil. Just like you talk, I'm not talking to the devil. Well, you can say a couple things to him. You can say, get behind me, Satan, right? Uh, you can say, I reject that thought. He's the ver only person you can legitimately say, go to hell to. <laughs> and not be in trouble. But the idea is you, you remind yourself of what is true. In Psalm 42, the psalmist was troubled. His emotions seemed to be getting the best of him, causing him to cry out, Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why are you disturbed within me? Then he talked to himself and he said, Put your hope in God and I will yet praise him. He's my Savior and my God. I love that. So he's, Man, I'm getting down. I don't know what to do. Hey, listen, self. Remember this. So in effect, he talked to himself. He quotes a scripture out loud. He reminds himself as, of what is true. Because we all have moments where we doubt. We all have lapses of faith. We all have moments of despair where you don't understand what's going on in your life. So you need to learn how to pray and you need to learn how to think. And there's one last principle. You need to live right. So it's right praying, verses six to seven. It's right thinking, verse eight. And the third and final principle, it's right living, verse nine. These things that you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Look, hearing what I'm saying tonight isn't gonna do you any good if you don't do it, right? You've gotta do it. The Bible says don't just be a hearer of the word, but also be a doer of the word. Because if you're just a hearer of a word, you're like a person that looks at the reflection in a mirror and walks away and forget what they look like. Okay, so the idea is take these truths and start applying them in your lives. You can't separate outward action and inward attitude. I mean, if Christ is really living in you, it should affect you in the way that you live. 
It doesn't mean you'll be perfect. It doesn't mean you'll be flawless. But it does mean that people will see in you results or fruit, as the Bible calls it, that would indicate you were a true follower of Jesus Christ. So it's right living. So God wants us to live right with him, and then he promises that we will have peace. The God of peace will be with you, he says. You see, living right with God results in having the peace of God. Let me ask you, in closing, do you have God's peace right now? You say, what do you mean God's peace? I mean an inward tranquility, an inward calm, a sense that everything is right between you and God. Because the Bible says that the peace of God that passes all understanding will keep your heart and mind in Christ. So it's like God puts his peace in your life. So when you don't worry, but instead you pray, God says, I'll put peace there. And it's interesting because the word that is used there to describe peace is a military term where God says, I'll post a sentry on your heart or a guard on your heart. So when you don't worry, but instead you pray, God says, I'm gonna put Sergeant Peace in front of the door of your heart and he's gonna watch over you and keep those other things at bay. Do you have that peace inside? Listen to this. Before you can have the peace of God, you first have to have peace with God. And the problem is, before we're Christians, we're at war with God. We're fighting with God. We're running from God. And there's no peace. There's no inward tranquility. That's why people get high. That's why people drink. That's why people are constantly distracting themselves. Constant stimulation for the brain, you know. Because they don't like to be alone with their thoughts and be reminded of the fact that deep inside they're afraid and they're full of anxiety and, and there are a lot of things that concern them in life, especially the fear of death. And listen, if you're not a Christian, you should be afraid of death. I'm telling you, you don't be afraid. I'm talking to Christians. If you're not a Christian, be very afraid. Because death is not the end. That's just the entrance into the afterlife. And after that comes a judgment. You don't want to face the judgment of God. God will forgive you of all of your sins. Why did Jesus die on that cross for you 2,000 years ago? The Bible says the punishment for our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. So what that means is Jesus died on the cross in my place so I can have this peace with God. I was reading the paper today and I noted that there is a 24 million New York lotto ticket waiting to be claimed. <laughs> so somewhere, I presume in New York, is some person walking around with a ticket in their pocket, in their wallet, in their purse. Who knows, they may have thrown it in the trash. If they can retrieve it and get it in on time, they will win 24 million dollars. That's a lot of money. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to win the lottery? I read about one person, a couple actually, won 217 million, 158 million after taxes. One day you don't have that much money, the next day 158 million. And then the experts or the lottery officials told these people, take the money and hush. Because the moment it's announced that you have that much money, people come out of the woodwork. I read about one woman named Evelyn Bayshore who won the lottery two times. She won $3.9 million the first time and $1.4 million the next time. Her observations, she said, everybody wanted my money. And then she said, winning the lottery isn't all it's cracked up to be. I won the American dream and I lost it too. It was a hard fall and I hit rock bottom, end quote. Curtis Sharp won five million in the lottery. And according to the article, he blew most of his cash on booze, babes, and bad investments. And uh, he concluded, a fool and his money are soon parted. Honey, I acted like a fool. Then there's the sad story of Jack Whitaker. You may have heard of him. He won $315 million in the lottery. Eight months after his big score, he was robbed of $545,000 in a strip club. 
you know, it's, it's a bad idea to go to a strip club, okay? Can we just establish that? But to go into a strip club with $500,000 in a briefcase, even a worse idea. So he got robbed. A month later, tragically, his granddaughter died of an overdose of drugs bought with an allowance that he gave her after he won the lottery. And a short time later, his daughter also died of a drug overdose. He told reporters, I wish I'd torn that lottery ticket up. <laughs> and I bring this up because I think sometimes we may think, man, if I just had that much money, I know I would be content. If I just had this relationship, I know I would be content. And so here's my question. Are you a happy and content person tonight? Because the theme of this epistle uh, of Paul to the Philippians, to the church of Philippi, is how to be happy, how to be fulfilled, and how to be content. And you think, well, if I just had this, I know I would find contentment. I heard the story of a wealthy employer who once heard one of his employees say, if I had $1,000, I know I'd be content. He said, really? He walked over, he said, you know, I've never found contentment for my money, and I'm gonna reach in my pocket here and give you $1,000, there you go. And, and he walked away and overheard the person say, I should have asked for $2,000, right? I mean, that's uh, human nature for you, isn't it? Uh, experts have proven that getting more stuff does not bring happiness or contentment. One psychologist who had done a lot of study on what brings contentment concluded, quote, if people shoot for a certain level of affluence thinking that will make them happy, they find that on reaching it they become very quickly habituated and at that point they start hankering for the next level of income, property, or good health. So it just goes on and on. The Bible says, hell and destruction is never full, and so is the heart of man never satisfied. But here in Philippians is a man who found satisfaction. And he's sharing the secret with us. Now, remember that uh, the theme of this book, as I've already pointed out, has been joy and happiness. <laughs> and Paul had nothing to be happy about. He was actually under house arrest at the time. He didn't know how things were gonna turn out for him. He might be acquitted, or he might be beheaded. Yet in the midst of all of this, he writes in the book of Philippians, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. So what is the secret to Paul's happiness and contentment? Well, the answer to that is found in a word that is often repeated in the book of Philippians. It's the word mind. He uses the word mind 10 times and also the word think five times. Add to that the times he uses the word remember and you have 16 references to the mind. So simply Paul is telling us we need to learn how to think right. We need to learn how to think biblically. We need the right mind, attitude, and outlook as we have God's joy in a troubled world. So let's read together Philippians 4, starting in verse 10. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, but I have learned in whatever state I am in to be content. Underline that verse. I have learned in whatever state I'm in to be content. For I know how to be a base, verse 12. I know how to abound everywhere and in all things. And I've learned both in being full and being hungry, when I'm abounding and when I'm suffering need, verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Great verse. We think we're gonna find that contentment from a bigger home, a nicer or faster car, a higher, sp a higher salary, or maybe a new spouse, or a new face, or a new body because the grass is always greener on the other side, right? But real contentment, according to the Bible, is not a state of account, it's a state of heart. Let me repeat that. Real contentment, according to the Bible, is not a state of account, it's a state of heart. There's a Japanese proverb that says, quote, even if you sleep in a thousand mat room, you can only sleep on one mat. And that's true. And as I pointed out, Paul was uncertain about his future. And if this wasn't enough, uh, the believers were sort of divided on Paul. Many would think, everyone would think Paul was the greatest thing since sliced bread. I mean, he's like the living, breathing apostle. 
reading, giving scripture to us, but some had turned against Paul. Some were critical of Paul. There was some division about Paul, and then others, of course, loved him deeply. And uh, so he's facing all of this, yet he has found this great contentment. Listen, contentment can come not just because we have conquered our circumstances, but because we have learned to live with them. I want to say that again. Contentment can come not because we have necessarily conquered our circumstances, but because we have learned to live with them. I read about a man who had this very beautifully groomed front lawn. It was just absolutely perfect. And then a heavy crop of dandelions showed up and uh, he tried everything he could to get rid of them and nothing worked. And so he wrote a letter to the School of Agriculture uh, telling them all the things he had tried, looking for some advice on how to get rid of the dandelions. And they emailed him back and said, he, where he said, what should I do now? And they emailed back this response, we, we suggest you learn to love them. And sometimes we, we have dandelions in our life. We have problems in our life and we say, how do I get rid of this problem? Maybe you need to adapt. It was on this very platform that I interviewed Johnny Erickson Tata. You may recall. In fact, it's on the radio today, yesterday and today my conversation with her. And as I re-listened to it, I was just stunned by what she said. Sitting in that wheelchair as a quadriplegic for so many years now, she said, I thank God for this wheelchair. I'm thinking, wow. And the reason she can say that is because she has come into a, such a deep relationship with Jesus that she's saying, I wouldn't have it any other way. Boy, you talk about adapting. So I don't know what you're facing right now. I don't know what new problem has come into your life, but I want you to realize that you can adapt to it and you can find a state of contentment. Listen, Paul says, I've learned in whatever state I'm in, therein to be content. Notice he says, I've learned. Know this, contentment does not come naturally. Selfishness comes naturally. Just watch children. You can have a child playing with a couple of toys, just as happy as can be, content. Another child walks in the room with a different toy, and suddenly that child with the other toys is no longer happy, right? Boy, I'm sure glad we outgrow that, aren't you? Oh, wait a second. We don't. <laughs> What's that saying? The only difference between the men and the boys is the price of their toys? Haven't you ever had something you say, I love this, this is so great, I'm so happy with it, and then you see someone with maybe a newer version, a faster version, and suddenly you're no longer happy with yours. Maybe you go to a store and there's something there. You don't really want it, but there's only one left. And you think, I might buy it. I don't think I'll buy it. I don't really care. And as you walk away, someone else reaches and grabs it and suddenly you want it. Why? Because it became more valuable? No, because somebody else wanted it. This is human nature. Let me restate it. It's sinful human nature. But we have to learn how to be content. You have to teach a child how to share. And in the same way, we need to be taught, we need to learn how to be content. It's interesting, the word Paul uses here, for I have learned to be content, is uh, a word in the original language that could be translated, I've attained or been initiated. <laughs> it's sort of a phrase that would be used at the time of, by the pagans even, to talk about attaining sort of a hidden truth. So Paul's almost having a little fun with this. And he's saying, hey, I found the hidden truth. I've been initiated. I know the secret. What is it? I've learned in whatever state I'm in, therein to be content. But, but how did you learn this, Paul? Verse 12. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. In other words, how to be low and how to be high. Everywhere and in all things I've learned to be full and to be hungry, to abound and to suffer need. Another translation puts that verse this way. Actually, I don't have a sense of needing anything personally. I've learned by now to be quite content whatever my circumstances. I'm just as happy with little as with much or with much as with little. I found the recipe for being happy whether full or hungry, hands full or hands empty. Hey, I've learned it, Paul says. And he wasn't angry when he couldn't make ends meet. At the same time, he, he was not uneasy when God was blessing him with more than he needed. He had found the balance. It reminds us of what is said in Proverbs. 
Uh, in Proverbs 30, verse 8, it, the writer says, give me neither poverty nor riches. Give me just enough to satisfy my needs, Lord. For, I, for if I go rich, I may deny you and say, who's the Lord? And if I'm too poor, I may steal and insult God's holy name. Listen, God knows just the right amount to give us in every area of our life. Okay, so what is the secret of his contentment? It came down to who he knew, not to what he had. The secret of contentment is found not in what you have, it's found in who you know. Hebrews 13, five says, let your way of living be without coveting, and be content with such things as you get, for he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. When you have Christ in your life, and you're having a close friendship and relationship with him, uh, praying and digging into his word and becoming more like him each and every day, you'll find that contentment because he is with you. This is what David meant when he wrote, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Only the person who can say, the Lord is my shepherd, can then say, I shall not want. And if you're saying to me right now, you're always wanting, it always has to be the next thing, the bigger thing, the latest thing, or whatever. Is the Lord really your shepherd? Have you really come to know him the way you need to? Contentment is not a state of account, as I said, but a state of heart. Real contentment is found in making the most of the least. Real contentment is found in making the most of the least. Now look at what Paul says in verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now understand, Paul had the very unusual experience of dying and going to heaven and coming back to earth again, which you know actually wouldn't be that great of a thing. I mean, can you imagine dying and going to heaven and having to come back to earth? You know, we often wish our loved ones who have preceded us to heaven would come back to us. But they can't, and, they, and I don't think they would if they could. And I don't think if you were in heaven, if given a choice, you would want to go back either. Uh, but here's Paul, he, he dies. We don't know when exactly it happened. We assume it may have been a stoning in Antioch where he was thought of as dead. So it may have been at that moment he entered into God's presence and there he is and he's welcomed by the Lord himself. Welcome to heaven, Paul. Well done, good and faithful servant. Lord, it's great to be here. Paul, I've got some good news and some bad news. What's the good news, Lord? Well, you're coming back again. Back again? Yeah, that brings me to the bad news. I'm gonna send you back to planet Earth. But Lord, why? Well, there's some believers down there praying that you will be raised from the dead. Lord, don't listen to their prayers. Paul might have said, they're sinners. I don't want to go back. Oh, Lord, uh, uh, Paul, I have a work for you to do still. So meanwhile, back there in Antioch, maybe they're praying for Paul. Oh, Lord, help Paul. Lord, we love Paul. And all of a sudden, you know, the, the color comes back into his face and he, his eyes flutter and his hand turns into a fist and boom, he hits someone. I mean, that's what I would have done. Like, what are you doing praying for me to come back? But he had been to heaven. Interesting, he didn't write a book about it. So many people have gone to heaven, I'll put that in quotes, and written books about it. Do you believe these stories, Greg? You want my honest opinion? Generally, no. Well, don't be a doubter. Well, how about if I be a skeptic? The only reliable source on the topic of heaven is the book I'm holding in my hand, the Bible. This is trustworthy. Someone writes a book and says, I went to heaven, I saw unicorns and rainbows and ice cream, you know, wonderful. Maybe that happened, maybe that didn't happen. I have no way of quantifying your statements. But I know this book is true, so I'm not really gonna attach a lot of importance to what you are saying. But I am gonna attach a lot of importance to what the Bible is saying. And here's what Paul said. He, he went into God's presence he says, now look, if I was in the body or out of the body, actually, I'm not really sure. But I, I'll tell you this, I heard things that, that I can't even explain, and what I saw was paradise. He uses an interesting word in the Greek. It was a paradise, which was a word that was used to describe the royal garden of a king. So think of a magnificent estate, 
uh, with beautifully manicured gardens that went on forever. Paul uses that picture to describe what he saw. But then he goes on to say in the book of Corinthians uh, that the Lord sent him a thorn in the flesh to keep him humble after having a revelation of this kind. And uh, three times he asked the Lord to take it away. And the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you. And Paul says, so I'll boast of my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So are these the words of a madman? No, they're the words of a man who had found contentment and fellowship with God, regardless of problems or circumstances. Listen, contentment is not the fulfillment of what you want. Contentment is the realization of how much you already have. Let me say it again, listen to this. Contentment is not the fulfillment of what you want. It is the realization of how much you already have. Contentment is understanding that if I'm not satisfied with what I have, I'll never be satisfied with what I want. And here's what the Bible says, 1 Timothy 6.6. 6, Godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into the world, we'll carry nothing out. So having food and clothing, be content. Do you have a meal in your stomach? Do you have clothes on your back? Some form of transportation that got you here to this service? Be content. Stop looking over your shoulder and saying, if only I had this or I had that, because I could just as easily say, why don't you come with me over to the hospital and we'll visit this person that is facing cancer right now? Or why don't we go over here and have another conversation with Johnny Erickson Tata, who has spent most of her life in a wheelchair? And after that, we can go over here and talk to someone who just lost a child. And you're talking about how hard you have it? Look, we all have our trials and tribulations, but no matter what, we we can find our contentment in our relationship with God. Be content. Again, it does not come from what you have, it comes from who you know. There's an Arabian proverb, very profound. I'll put it on the screen here so you can take it in. Arabian proverb. Better to have a handful of dry dates and be content therewith than to own the gate of peacocks and be kicked in the eye by a broody camel. <laughs> Is that not awesome? <laughs> Better a handful of dry dates and content therewith than to own the gate of peacocks and be kicked in the eye by a broody camel. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> but I just like the idea of being kicked by a broody camel. I think the gist of it's pretty clear. That's a real proverb, by the way. I think the gist of it's clear. Just be content with what you have. I'm not sure about what the gate of peacocks is or, or who this broody camel is. I've met a few moody camels. I've met even more spitting camels. Uh, if you've ever been to Israel, they'll spit right in your face. Um, but be content with what you have. Now verse 13, a, a keeper verse. Every believer should commit this one to memory. Let's say it out loud together, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Let's say it again. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Love that verse. Don't forget that verse. You might need it before the night is over. The J.B. Phillips, which is a paraphrase, puts it this way. I'm ready for anything through the strength of the one who lives within me. Ready for anything. I can do all things through Christ. Take out the word Christ and put in another word and everything fails. I can do all things through drugs and alcohol that strengthen me. Some actually believe that. Some think if I just had a good stiff drink, if I smoked another joint, if I had another hit, everything will be fine. But of course it isn't fine. I just read about a lead singer of a rock band that just committed suicide. And he uh, talked about the fact uh, that he had been using drugs ever since he was a young man. Here's a guy with his fame and his fortune and, and just did a concert last night and then he took his own life. And when are we gonna get the memo that these people in Hollywood have nothing to tell us? Nothing. Uh, we admire them, we follow them on Instagram, we think they're our friends. And we talk about them and, and you look at the empty lives so many of them live and 
how some of them become strung out on drugs and alcohol. Some of them take their lives. They can't keep a marriage longer than like a day. And why do we look to them as our examples? These people really have so little to offer us. I can do all things through drugs and alcohol. No, I can't do anything through drugs and alcohol. In fact, they'll make my problems even worse. How about this? I can do all things through education that strengthens me. Well, I have a good education. I have my degree. That I can face anything. No, not really. I won't do it either, as wonderful as a good education is. How about this? I can do all things through money that strengthens me. Well, you can do some things with money. But you can't do all things, can you? I can do all things through success that strengthens me. No, that doesn't work either. I can do all things through friends who strengthen me. Well, sometimes friends abandon you, don't they? How about this one? I can do all things through politics that strengthen me. Not at all. <laughs> you can do some things through politics. There is a place for politics. I think it's a great thing when people want to run for office and help our country, though I have to wonder why anyone would want to be in elected office these days and the political climate that we're in and, and the rancor and the hostility and the venom that's out there, but there's some things you can do, but not all things. But Christ fits perfectly. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That fits, doesn't it? Haven't you found that to be true? Because no thing or no one can empower and enable us to do what God wants us to do, except Him. It's Him working through us. And this, by the way, brings the perfect balance. It shows the place of God's power and man's response. It does not teach the Christian does everything for themselves, nor does it teach that God does everything for the Christian. It teaches that the power and resources that we need are there, but I must appropriate them. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It doesn't even say Christ does everything and I do nothing. It says I do all things through Christ. But the flip side of that is, according to Jesus in John 15, Apart from me, you can do nothing. So on one side of the coin, apart from him, I can do nothing. On the other side of the coin, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I love it. It's just the perfect balance. As we learned earlier in Philippians, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God that works in you, both to will and do of his good pleasure. So there's God's part and there's my part. Work out my own salvation conveys the idea of going into a mine discovering the gold or the silver and bringing it out. So work it out. Not work for your own salvation. That's impossible. It's a gift. But work it out. Work it out in your life. But then it goes on to say, for it is God that works in you, both to will and do of his good pleasure. So God will give you the power, but you must appropriate that power in your life. If you, if you get the fastest car on the road, you know, most horsepower of anyone on planet Earth, if you don't fire that car up and put your pedal to the metal, nothing's going to happen. And a lot of us are, are in this fast car, so to speak, this wonderful Christian life with all the resources we need, and we never start the car and accelerate. And God has given you what you need, but you need to apply it. Listen to this. This might surprise you. There are some things only God can do, and some things only you can do. Some would disagree. No, God does everything. No, no, actually, it's not true. Maybe I should restate it another way. There's some things only you can do and some things only God will do. It's not that he can't, but he's given you a free will. Let me illustrate. Only God can guide. God will point me in a direction, say, go there. But is God gonna airlift me over there even if I don't wanna go? I don't wanna go, I'm airlifted over. There you go, no. He points, I follow. Only God can guide, only I can follow. Only God can convict me of my sin. Only I can repent of my sin. God will not repent for me. And the problem is we often try to do God's part uh, instead of letting him do it. And by that I mean, <laughs> if we know someone is not a believer, you know, we get a little impatient with them. And so we start manipulating a little bit or, 
or uh, pressuring them too much and actually make the situation worse. We need to leave it in the hands of the Lord. Now we get down to some nitty gritty stuff as we wrap up the book of Philippians because we can talk all day about walking with God and being strengthened by Him. But if it does not affect the way that we live, and specifically, according to Paul, the way that we give, it means nothing. Philippians 4, verse 14. Nevertheless, you've done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek a gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. And indeed, I have all, and I am abound, and I am full, having received from Epaphroditus, a friend of Paul, the things that you sent to me, which were a sweet smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well pleasing to God, and God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You know, we quote that verse a lot, that God will supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory, but we need to see it in its context. Now, I mentioned earlier, getting more stuff does not bring happiness and contentment. Let me make another statement now. Giving more stuff does. Getting more stuff will not make you happy. Listen, giving more stuff will. Oh yes. Some would say, oh no, no. It's all about getting, getting, getting. No, actually it's about giving, giving, giving. Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. Or a better way to translate it, it's happier to give than it is to receive. It's a happy thing to give. And so Paul is bringing this up now as he's talking about these believers. He's commending the believers in Philippi who are not that well off financially for helping him out in a pinch. He needed some help financially. He needed food, clothing, other things. And, uh, and he's saying, man, you guys came through for me even though you really couldn't afford to come through for me. And I want to just thank you and tell you this. Fruit is going to abound to your account, verse 17. It's not that I want the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. See, what we need to understand is when we give of our finances to the work of the kingdom, uh, we invest spiritually, and that will be spiritual fruit to our account. Some are very able to do a lot and they don't do much. Heard about a wealthy man who was approached about making a contribution to some cause. The urgent need was stated to him and, and he said, no, I know why you think that I can write you a check for $100,000 because I'm a man with my own business and, and I have all the signs of affluence, but maybe there's some things about my life that you did not know. He said, for instance, did you know that my mother is in an expensive nursing home right now. They said, no, we didn't know that, sorry. Yeah, well, maybe you didn't know that my brother recently died and left a family of five without insurance. Wow, we didn't know that either. Yeah, you probably didn't know that my son, who has a lot of faith, has gone in the mission field and makes hardly any money and he needs the needs of his family met. No, we didn't know that either. And then he says, well, if I didn't give any of them a penny, why should I give you anything? Oh, there's people like this. Lots of people. And they miss out on the blessing. That's all I'll say. But I have found that often those that have the least will give the most. And sometimes those that have the most will give the least. So what Paul is saying is, hey, remember the work of the Lord. You know, you set money aside if you're smart for taxes. <laughs> you set money aside for savings. Uh, and I hope you set money aside for the Lord's work. You know, when you go and you get your latte in the morning, as I do, you know, you give a tip to the server, the, the barista, right? Here's a tip, thank you very much. Or in the restaurant, you give a tip, but then when we're in church and the offering is being received, you're like mystified by these weird bags. What, what, what are these and why are they here and what does this mean? You're supposed to put money in them. That's what it means. So you can have fruit abound to your account. So you can be invested in the work that God is doing. And every believer 
should give. That's what Paul's pointing out, and he's commending them for giving. Now, with that backdrop, we understand verse 19, which is a very important verse. My God shall supply all of your need according to his riches in glory by Christ. Now, understand this verse does not float out in space all by itself. For every promise of God, there is a premise. Let me say that again. For every promise of God, there is a premise. This promise is embedded in the context of chapter four. What is the context? The context is be content with what you have, be generous, give to the work of the Lord, and my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ. Now we generally apply this verse to financial challenges. You know, maybe when an unexpected bill comes due or uh, there's some financial crisis, we'll say, well, the Lord will provide because he promises my God will supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ. And that's true. But it's not limited to finances. You could apply it in other areas as well. For instance, if your marriage is in trouble, you could also say my God will supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ. Hey, if you're a single person looking for the right person, you could apply this verse, my God will supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. If there's a need for maybe a physical healing, you could apply it there as well. My God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And certainly you can apply it to your financial need as well. My God will supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So this has been all about happiness and contentment and here's what we've learned. Happiness does not come from seeking self-fulfillment. It comes from seeking the fulfillment of others. It doesn't come from seeking self-fulfillment because then you're like the proverbial dog chasing its tail. Because when you get what you think will make you happy, you'll just want something more. Or you can find it in your relationship with God and serving others. Happiness does not come from seeking happiness. It comes from seeking God. When you seek him first and his righteousness, which means his rule and reign in your life, all these things will be added to you. And what are those things? What you'll eat, what you'll drink, what you wear. Jesus says, I'll take care of that for you. You just put God first and you honor the Lord first and he'll take care of that. Happiness does not come from getting, it comes from giving. Contentment does not come from getting, it comes from giving. Listen to this, no one has ever been honored for what he received, but rather for what he gave. Think about it. Has anyone ever been honored for a great gift they received? No but they are honored when they gave something. And that's the point that is before us. Listen, you can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead. And the way you do that is when you live your life for the glory of God and dedicate every aspect of it to Him. <music> 